All right, so today what we're going to do is we're going to be kicking off again with chapter 9. This is organizing files. This is a direct follow-up to our last chapter, which was reading and writing files. In the last chapter, some of the things we did is we learned how to open files, we learned how to read from them, we learned how to write to them, and today we're going to be playing around with moving files, deleting files, all of that kind of stuff by extension. Now, I would say that the tasks are pretty similar, and you're going to find everything you want to do from last class onward is pretty similar. I kind of view it like this. Let me show you how I, I think that we've, we've hit a benchmark and we should be celebrating that. <coughs> Chapter seven is pattern, ma pattern matching with regular expressions, right? That is, the, that was, anyway, this isn't last class. This was actually the class before that. That was the last chapter where we covered functionality that was specific to Python. Every other chapter we're covering is things that are actually practical, that are task oriented, right? So when we're doing pattern matching with regular expressions, we're learning a computer concept. We're learning a sub-language that teaches us how to modify text, right? When we do chapter eight, we're reading and writing files. We're learning how to actually manipulate stuff on our disk on the operating system. <coughs> chapter nine is organizing files. It's moving them and deleting them. Chapter 10, we return back to programming. And then chapter 11, we're back to the, you know, doing what is more administration. It's more practical stuff, right? So. Debugging, computer programming, administration, 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 administration. All this stuff here that says working with, that we're actually going to be doing like exercise-based stuff, right? You're not going to come out being a better programmer, but you're going to come out knowing how to do more things with the programming skills you've built. We're going to be showing you more things to do with that. So you're going to see that these chapters feel different too, right? And they're going to feel different because you're not going to have to twist your brain to learn a whole new language to do regexes. That stuff is really cool, but what we're going to be doing is simply applying what we've learned. All right. So let's go ahead and review a little bit on the last chapter, which was reading and writing files, right? All right, we got this guy right here. We call this a directory, right? <coughs> What's the root of the directory? Anyone know? C. C, that's right. The root is the topmost part of the directory, right? If I was to say something like, let's come down here. So we left off on it. Okay, os.path.join, we talked about this before, right? This is our, our method of taking different components of that hierarchy and getting out a, a file name from it, right? So we can see here this user bin spam that we're creating with the user bin and spam, which are part of those, actually they're not part of the one above, but they're part of a hierarchy. We have this uh, get CWD. Who remembers what that stands for? Current working directory. directory. Current working directory, right? And that is what? <clears throat> Anyone remember what that represents or what, what? That, that, that is about? Where the program's executed from? That's exactly right. Where the program's executed, the environment the program starts up in. And why is that important when we're talking about files? Why does it matter where we start up our program? In? So everything's relative to the address. That's exactly right, right there. It's because of relative path names, right? So if we want to find a file inside of the directory, it depends. Wherever we start up in, we're going to find different files. So when we do relative addressing, where we start up in is very important. If we do absolute addressing, is it important? Does it matter at all? What do we say? Not at all, right? If we do absolute addressing, it doesn't matter where we start up that stuff. Okay, so we have this concept of chdir, right? And that's simply going to move you to a different uh, relative address or absolute address, it doesn't matter, but it's going to give you a different ability to do relative addressing. If we're in the C drive and we say we want to go into, let's say, the folder foo and find the file bar, it's going to make total difference whether or not we're in root C or we're somewhere else entirely. And we can use chdir to change those relative addressing, the relative addressing. We talked about this before. This is we use this as an example. We said if we're in fizz, right, we're going to find a different spam.txt than if we're in bacon. That's what we're talking about. When we say relative addressing. It matters where you're at. Okay, os.makeDirs. This is just one easy way here of creating directories. And you can see here that when you create those directories, it doesn't just create delicious. It creates delicious and waffles for you. So it creates all of the directories that you need. Right, os.makeDirs. We're going to see some things in this lecture we're going to do today that are oftentimes similar. And you'll, what I mean by that is you will find things that exist in OS that are the same that we're going to cover today. We're going to cover more of that. But notice in this, this chapter, 
we really focused a lot on OS and OS.path. That was the majority of it. How do we work with paths and how do we work with the actual uh, files, reading them? All right, let's go through and pick out some other stuff we can ask questions on. OS.path.getSize, that was real simple, right? We returned a simple size of that file in bytes. And then what we can do there is we can take OS.lister and it shows us all of the different file names. And then we did an example in the class where we iterated through that list and we said for each different file, calculate us the size using this os.path.getSize, add them up and give us the sum. We, we did this here, we said hello file.read, right? So what we do is we open up a file with this open command. We went through this. You can open a file right here with whatever path you want to give it, and you give it a mode, right? We have R as the mode here. What, are some, what is the other mode that we looked at? W. w, right? So R is the mode to read a file, but we also looked at how to write a file. So you can open up a file two different ways, right? So we can read the file, we can write the file. There was one more, I think we covered append too, which actually, there we go, with the append mode, yep. Pass A to it, and then when we write to the file, we don't clobber it, we don't destroy the old one, right? So we went through that too, we covered it. And then we covered this thing here, uh, shelves, right? So we're gonna go through that here too. This is the shelf module. And we said what that does is it gives us the ability to take these Python objects that we have, right? We can take them and make them into essentially strings. Take a complex Python object like a dictionary. Let me show you some of this stuff here. Do, do, do. There we go. So we can take a we can we can say something like let a equals uh, foo bar. Oh no, nope, I'm not even thinking here. I have been working way too long today. A equals there foo bar, and now we have a an actual Python object. This here is a, is, is a dictionary, right? So we have a key foo, and we have a value bar. And what shelving is going to do is it's going to take this object and it's gonna create a file that stores that object and we can read it back later. So when we went through that, let's see if this works. We went through that, we take it here, we create a shelf, we open up a file called my data, we create this Python object here, this is just their example, it's an array with three things in it, and then we add it to the shelf, we shelve it, right? And then we close the shelf and it's done. Uh, and we can do whatever we want with that. Here we're opening the file, right? So we open the file, my data, and what you'll see here is when we call shelf open, then the shelf file actually has in it cats. Just pulls that object right back out. So the purpose of this, just to recap on it, the purpose is we can create these objects in Python, but if we ever want to save them for later, we, don't, we didn't have a method of doing that before this class, right? So we, we showed off shell as saying, this is a method where you can create a program and save it and then resume it later. All right, and then we went into some of the, the examples, right? And in that example, I think one of those examples, we created the, yes. the city capital thing and in the other one we did the password manager, right? Random quiz generator and password manager. I'm not gonna put that through that. All right. So there's our 10 minute three, our 10 minute recap on three hours of Python in the last class. Now let's go ahead and kick off with organizing files. So when it comes to organizing files, you can see here some of the tasks that we have in organizing <coughs> files. These are the examples that they give us. But likely you'll be using, you'll be coming up with your own. It'll be totally different. But making copies of all PDF files and only the PDF files in every subfolder of a folder, right? So what does that mean? Does anyone have an idea what that kind of task entails? Anyone with any programming experience before? <coughs> Recursion. Recursion, that's right. So what we're gonna do with that is, we start off in a directory, wherever you wanna start, and you go through and you start to look at the things in the directory, right? And you say, is this a directory or is this a file? And if it is a directory, you have to recurse into it. Then if you're only going to copy the PDF files, you have to say, is this file that I find a PDF? And if it is, I need to copy it. And where am I going to copy it to? Right? 
right? So there's an example of something where we're filling in with this, this lesson here. Removing all of the leading zeros for the, in the file name for every file in a folder of hundreds of files named spam001, 002, 003, and so on. Right? So for this, you go through a file, a directory, you find a bunch of files, you have to know how to parse the text of that file name. So you get the file name from that os.listers, we saw that in the last class, right? We saw how to do that. So now you have a bunch of file names, you store the old one, you look at the new one, you say, how am I going to manipulate it? Right? Now a file name is a string. So we talked about some of those things we can do, right? You can concatenate strings, you can put regexes into strings, you can do all that kind of stuff. So you parse the string, and then you simply rename the file, or you move the file. Compressing the contents of several folders into one zip file. Okay, that's a little bit more complex, and that requires a library. So let's go ahead and start off here. This is shutil or shell utilities, right? When you work on a shell, First thing, does anyone here, if you don't have any experience with programming, you probably don't know what a shell is. A shell is this thing. When I hold that and I hit enter, I just popped up two shells. This is very useful for programming, right? It gives you the ability to do specific things, right? Like I can take it and I can say something like uh, mkdir, and then I can say text. Of course, that's got to happen. What are we doing? It Okay, let's jump into it and see what I created last time. There we go. So I have this directory called text, and I've inside of it I have two files, foo and foobar, right? I can delete those files by saying rm foo, of course. This is a Mac issue, by the way. I would expect that to be a different color. I don't even know how to make no less color in a Mac. G. There we go. That's what I'm used to. Alias L equals LSG. Let's not do that again. Okay. So uh, you can see here that I have a, a, a directory foo and a file foobar. I can do different things with it. I can create a new directory if I want. This is all doing it in what we call the shell. I can see again what I have. I can delete the file I just created. We can go into different directories. You can see all these commands I'm using, ls or in this case L, because I didn't want to do the whole G thing with the colors, that's a Macism. Uh, but I have RM and CD, all of that kind of stuff, that's, that's, uh, that's how the shell works. So we have this, this new module we're introducing called SHUtil, and what that's going to do is give people that have experience with Bash and shells and window PowerShell and that kind of thing, it's going to give you the ability to pull that into Python without knowing the other ways to do it inside of the OS module. So we covered that module in the last class, right? If we take Python 3, right? Let me clear it up. Boop. And I say import OS. I can say help OS. And there's different things in here that we can do. And by the way, that could be too big. Let's pop it up. There we go. Uh, so one of the things that we have inside of OS is we should have unlink. OK. So we have remove and we have unlink, right? You'll find these types of functions inside of OS. These are also inside of shutil. This is just, shutil is an easier way to do all of this stuff. Marco. Can I just like uh, uh, mention some life experiences with this stuff? Because like, I, I dabble in programming, and I started with shell stuff by, right. by doing little things on the shell. And I just wanted to mention that for anybody who's new to it, it's fun because when you're programming, that shell command is, is fun because when you're programming with that, it's really easy to test what you're writing. You just open up a shell and run the command, and then you can just copy the top. Once you make that command do what it is that you want, you just copy that into your code, use the shell command that he just showed you, and it's really easy to test. So I just want to make that, that comment. There's certainly a division here between the people who come from programming uh, the natural way and the people who come into programming the academic way, right? This is the academic way. I'm here to teach you tricks of the trade of how to become a programmer. If you didn't do this, a lot of people, myself included, became programmers more out of necessity or because we like just were in an environment. If you start off and you, you're in Windows and you use things like the PowerShell or you start off in Linux and you have things like the shell, you find yourself doing more and more programming tasks like Marco, right? If you're in QA, that's one of the areas where they have this, this transitionary period. I've learned how to use a computer and I'm really, really good at it and I can do all this typing stuff. You know, and then you find yourself doing more and more programming tasks. It's not like you, you do it through the class. 
So this is a module that is going to help people make that transition, right? So we have import OS, and now we have this new thing, shutil, and I can go help shutil. And in this, if I look for remove, do do, there should be another one in here. I am quite sure there is, and we'll find it. Maybe it's called delete file or something like that. There we go. And you have things like delete tree, rm tree, right? This is like a shell command. You'll find a lot of these. Unpack archive, this is really simple. So you'll find a lot of these utilities, which, Marco, you've really seen this command before? Which, Give it a, which one? The, the command which. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is a very popular Unix command. It tells you essentially, if you want to know where a program is located, you can feed it to which. But all of these here are essentially just commands that we use in shell. So now we're going to see how we can use that module here. OK. Well, let's get out of that and get into this. OK, so kicking it off, we say here, import shell util and OS. So now we're doing two things, right? OS has some utilities in there that are not any different or wouldn't be any different in the shell because they are exactly what you would do in the shell. In the shell, you have CD. In OS, you have chdir. They leave that alone. So we say import shutil and OS. This is a, a, a syntax in Python. We've seen that import one module. You just import module. You can actually import more than one. Just use a comma to separate them. So we say here, uh, import shell util and OS. And then we say os.chdir, and we give it a path. Right. So we're going right into the root. We're going right into the C drive. And now we're using shutil.copy. Right? And we give it the first path, which is the first file, and then where we want to copy it to. Right? Now you'll see here what it's returning. That's what this syntax is. You can see the font case is different. But it returns a C delicious spam text. So if we want to jump. Now, here's something else we should point out. The, this here, jumping into the C drive, doesn't make any difference on that command. Right? Doesn't make any difference on that command because we provide two absolute paths. So we say here, shutil copy, and we give it an absolute path to a file, and we give it a directory, and it copies this file into this directory. Very simple. You can use that for backing up everything. You have shutil.copy, eggs.txt, and we give it a new path. This time it's an exact path, right? It's not a directory. It's an actual fully qualified path with the file name at the end. And now we're actually copying eggs.txt and eggs2.txt, right? So these two syntaxes are slightly different. In the first, we give it a directory, it copies the file to the directory, and keeps the name the same. In the second, we give it a directory and a new name, and we get the new named file. OK. Uh, shutil will copy a single file. shutil copy tree will copy an entire folder and every folder and file contained in it. We talked about that earlier, this idea of recursion, right? Computers don't work on trees of files, right? They have to, you have to work on that. So how do you do it is you go and you navigate through that tree and do whatever you need. Well, shutil.copy is just like that. It does not recurse. But this new utility called copy tree does, and that makes it a lot easier, right? So now if you want to copy a directory and you got a bunch of crap in it, including other folders, you can just say copy tree and you get it all. Okay. So enter the following into the interactive shell. Import shutil os, os.chdir, and then we give it this new path. shutil.copy tree, bacon, bacon backup, and what does that do? We have this path here called bacon, and we have a new path called bacon backup, and it has all that stuff in it. Right? I would show you a lot of this thing, but it really, I mean, there's nothing much to show, right? You're just essentially doing a copy command. SHUtil.move, right? So when you copy a file, you're actually making a copy of it. When you move a file, you copy the file and then you delete the original, right? Or you rename the, the, the file to a new name. Can be implemented either way. But when you move the file, you lose the original one. No matter what happens, it's no longer there. When you copy a file, it is there. So it takes the same syntax as copy. There's really nothing new or exciting there. Move is move, copy is copy, move loses the original. OK. If you try to move a file here, right, 
cbacon.txt to a folder named heads, move is taking a folder name, right? Then you have a problem. And if you can't find the folder, it's gonna throw an error, right? <coughs> so notice what it's doing here. If it has an extension, right, it, it thinks it's a file. This station must be so small a file name, not a folder. So the bacon text file is renamed to X. If you don't have the extension, there you go. Here's what it's doing. In this case, what it's doing is we're simply dropping the extension. That's what they're showing you. So if you move a file, right, you're moving bacon.txt to a new file called X. And X no longer has the TXT extension. So they're telling you there to just essentially be careful with the extensions. In this one, though, they actually take it and they say here, if the folders that make up the destination must already be exist, or Python throws the exception. So here what you're doing is, you're taking a file, spam.txt, and you're trying to move it into a directory that doesn't exist, and in this case, Python doesn't know what to do when you get an exception, right? Which is the same thing that we saw, and any time you try to open up a file that doesn't exist, that's what you get. Open or write to, uh, file or directory that doesn't <laughs> exist. Okay. So now we find unlink, right? This is the OS thing. So this is where I say that there's this kind of, uh, there's this, this intersection here between shutils and OS unlink, right? shutil and OS, rather. <clears throat> we have this OS unlink. This is essentially going to take a path or a file, either one, and remove it. We have os.rmdir. This only deletes the folder at the path, right? And then we have shutil.rm tree. And what this does is it's going to recurse down and remove everything. A lot of these may seem somewhat like we, we're just going over these pretty quick. And the real reason why we're doing that is because these we're just showing off methods at this point, right? So whereas in, uh, we had that division, in previous lectures there was a, a specific concept I was trying to teach. In these lectures there really is no concept. And you're going to see a lot more of that. You're going to see a lot more of learning actual, you know, it's, it's almost like things you could memorize or things you should be introduced to, but they're not conceptually difficult at all. This is just boring administration, and that's why the book is literally called Automate the Boring Stuff, right? So in order to automate the boring stuff, you've got to learn some boring stuff. This is some boring stuff. Uh, okay. So this, we, we went through this in this last class, Lister, right? Lister's gonna show you everything inside of the directory. Does anyone have any questions about any of this stuff? Feel free to raise your hand. If not, I'm gonna move quicker because I'm gonna assume we've got it all figured out. OS.Lister is gonna show you all of the files inside of the directory, right? And what you're gonna do is you're gonna get a different file name for each one inside, and then we're gonna see whether or not it ends with .txt. Notice ends with here. If I was to open that back up, let's go here, uh, boop. If I was to go uh, hello, right, I have a string. If I was to go dot hello dot ends with, I think this should work. There we go. I put the parentheses in the other line. But what I'm trying to show off here is that ends with, in this case, is just the string. So you got to wrap your head around this idea that this path you get back is not special. So we're, we're testing here, but we're testing as if file name is just the string. So we're making sure that this string that we get back has rxt at the end dot rxt and dot rxt is the extension right you could be testing for mp3s or pdfs or txt files and that's all you're doing you're saying are oh, the last four characters dot txt or they dot pdf what do we have and if they are what do we do we call unlink right now we already went over unlink so we know what it does if anyone here forgets about what unlink does what do you do you look it up and help right so that's real simple let's go over that and i want to show you it one more time so we can just see it We've already imported OS, you can see it right here at the top. So we can go right to it. We don't have to read through all the crap of OS. We can just go help OS.unlink, and boom, we can see exactly what the issue is, right? And I'm gonna make that big so we can see it without a folder all over the place. Unlink, remove a file, same as remove, right? And now we get the complex stuff where the book may or may not go into it. If durfd is not none, it should be a file descriptor open to a directory and the path should be relative. Path will be relative to that directory. So you can see this here, this is the first thing we're getting, durfd. 
that is, let's skip that, because I don't want to go into that all the way. I think if the book gets into it, that's fine. But I don't, we haven't went into directory handle, so that's probably something I, uh, I should just leave that out for the time being, and we'll do it over lunch. All right. So, dinner, dinner. <laughs> is it coming, Mark? <laughs> yes. OK. Do you get the emails on that? Yes. Uh -huh. Cool. I should also have done an email check. Yep. Did we get rid of pineapple pizza yet? Uh, hey, uh, hey. I, well, <laughs> I, I'm currently amassing the social capital needed to make that investment. <laughs> It was a mix-up, and, and today's order will be all pineapple. <laughs> <laughs> hey. Oh, I hope you didn't pull that. <laughs> but he hasn't noticed. I kind of say that every week. Yeah, yeah. One of these days, you're gonna do it once, and I'm gonna die with black eyes, right? All right. So uh, here we go again. We have import OS, right? We're we're going back. We're importing the operating system module. Right? And we're doing the same thing we did before for file name in OSTER. We're iterating to each file in OSTER. If file name ends with out of TXT, now this time we've removed the unlink and we're printing things out first. It's always a good idea to print things out before you start deleting shit. Make sure your script is going to do what you want before you, you do bad things with it. Okay. Save deletes with the send to trash module. So we have this concept of RM tree, right? RM tree is actually doing things on the file system, right? It's, it's actually a file system based function. It's deleting all of the stuff as if you were writing your own operating system, if you will. Uh, there's a Python module called send to trash. And what that does is it simply moves your stuff, right? So I believe the way this module works is it looks for a trash can if your operating system has one and moves all of the crap there which is nice. If you use Windows, it's a recycling bin. Uh, I don't know if Mac has a trash can. Trash? <laughs> <laughs> it's the original. <laughs> the original trash can is what we have in the back from Robert. There we go. Uh, yeah, live dangerously and never use this module. That's my advice to you. Like logs, it's totally pointless. No. Uh, so we have this thing here, imports into trash. That's all it takes. Uh, now, here's what I think. I don't think to see after you've installed the module, right? So there, I know how to install the module. Who here remembers how we install the module? This is your Jeopardy question. What is pip3? Yes, okay, so what's the command pip3? Install, whatever. That's exactly right, right? So we, we introduced this before. We've done it before in the class live, so let's go ahead and do it now live. It wasn't horrible to me, which I can't say about everything. So what we're gonna do here is I'm going to clean this up, and we're gonna go here, uh, PIP3, of course, because it's OSX. Um, yeah. I, I use Python3 space dash m space pip space install and then the module name. That's terrifying. Let's not do that. <laughs> uh, so I have pip and pip has, pip is Python 3.7. So the lesson here is that OSX calls pip pip3 from Linux, you know. Uh, so yeah, fascinating. Anyway, so sudo pip install uh, send to trash. Or maybe I can just do pip install send to trash. Maybe I'll do sudo I don't pip. think you need to. Yeah. Pip install, I could even do user, huh? Send to trash, let's see if that works. Nope, okay, so pip install user. <laughs> there you go. Okay, Python 3, import, uh, let's clean that up. Import, send to trash. Voila. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the round of applause. I appreciate that. Yes. <laughs> okay. So anyway, I'm just I'm showing off my Mac OS X skills here. Uh, so let's go back to this. So, uh, yeah. Where does Unlink send the deleted file? I'm sorry. Say that one more time. Where does On link, okay, so your file system itself, think of it like this, it's a good question. Your file system is like, um, it's, like the, it's like a telephone book where you have a name and you have a number, right? That's how the file system works at the lowest level. So the name that you give it resolves to a number. The computer calls that number an I you don't have to know that. Where does it send that file? It doesn't, it simply deletes the entry. So when it deletes that entry, your computer no longer knows where that file is at. 
and your file system thinks it's free space. So if you have one of those old disks that spins, that you, you know, were a thing about 10 years ago, if you have one of those and you delete a file, you'll notice it happens instantly, no matter how big that file is, on most file systems. And the reason why it happens instantly is because it's not writing anything. It's literally deleting one line. So that file goes away instantaneously in the file system, but all of that data is still on disk, right? So you can actually pull the disk out and recover it. So where does it go? It doesn't go anywhere. It stays, all of that data stays exactly where it's at. The only difference is the computer no longer knows where it's at. So does that make sense to you? Okay. All right. And that's really cool, because if you have questions like that and you want to know more about file systems or whatever, we can do that kind of stuff too. Mm -hmm. But send to trash, what is it going to do? Send to trash is going to take that little directory entry and says, this file is stored in this file. <coughs> and it's simply going to say, nope, I'm not. I'm stored in the recycling bin. Right? And that's a little bit more complex than that, but you get the idea. All right. So here we go. And let's go back to this. And I will probably play with this module just because I'm curious to know where the trash can's at in, in OS X, and that sounds like a blast. So we have this uh, import, send to trash, and then we say bacon file open, bacon, A. Aha, A. What does that mean? Append. Append. No more from you, because they're sleeping. So <laughs> append, append means that we're going to create the file, and if the file already exists from the sleeping side of the room, what do we do? Stop sleeping, sleeping side of the room. Robert. If it doesn't exist? If it doesn't exist, what does it do? It creates a zero length. And That's right. And if it does exist, what happens? Uh, it, it starts the file position at the end of the file. That's right. So if it does exist, you don't clob it. That's the key. If you open a file for writing, one of the things you're going to learn, you're going to do this the hard way, no matter how many times I tell you, you're going to say, I want to write to a file. You're going to open it. You're going to give it the right mode of W. You're going to go look in that file, and you're going to say, all of my shit's gone, and all I wanted to do is write a line to it. And the reason why that happens is because write normally, it clobbers the file. That's the word you use. And clobber is every beginner's way of saying, oh, shit, I just lost something, right? Yeah. It, it's like it's, it's, in, it's, it's natively negative, and that's the reason. OK, and I love the fact that I can look back I expect to see code, and then I'm pleasantly surprised that you <laughs> request to please keep it on the code. Yeah. I don't blame them. I don't blame them. I would do the same thing. In fact, I'd probably just, I'm not even going to bring the HDMI game next time. All right. So we, we say here, uh, Bacon file all right. We've opened a file for appending. We write bacon is not a vegetable. Now, if that file has other crap in it, we just append it to it. We didn't clobber it, so save the day there. And then it's going to tell us here how many bytes it wrote. It wrote 25. So if you wanted to count these characters, which I won't do, you'll get 25. Then we say bacon file dot close, right? So now we're saying we're done writing to the file. And now we're going to do, we're going to send it to the trash, right? So it is gone. <coughs> Out of there. OK. Uh, so let's do that. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask one of you OSX fellers to tell me where in the hell the trash can's at, because I don't know. It's, it's many places. <laughs> what, do you want to put something in it or take something out? I haven't decided yet. Give me a second. Okay. I think it's a hidden directory in your user yeah, directory. Oh, that's where he, oh, he wants it like from the command line? Unless it's a network storage and stuff. Trash. Don't ruin the secret yet. <laughs> We don't know the question. Spoiler first. alert! <laughs> okay, let's take it and we're gonna exit out of that. <laughs> Control D, there we go. Okay. Uh, PWD, we're in this. I'm gonna create this thing called uh, uh, trasher.py. Now I'm gonna copy this with Mac, and I'll probably screw this up. But Nope, did it. Look at that. One point, I learned copy and paste. And then let's take it and go. Okay. So now I created trasher.py, and we're going to go ahead and run it. I don't think that that's the way. Yeah, no, it worked. Okay, Python 3, trasher.py. Now, where did it put my bacon.txt? Now you can now you can give me the spoiler. Home directory. 
Home directory. Uh, dot capital T rash. Aha! Yes. Oh, I didn't even know that. And then there's my bacon.txt. I was going to tell him where to go in the GUI. Bacon is not a vegetable. So now <laughs> we have it, it. it might actually show up there in the GUI. I don't know. It, it does, but I never okay. tried to get to it in the command line. Very cool. And all of my other work files. Great. Let's go back. <laughs> Let's do that. <laughs> okay. So there we go. And now here's the other thing. If I wanted to, I could take it and we could do proof of a point here and I could open this thing up. I think it's command this. This is how you do everything in OS X. It's their equivalent of an Omnibar. And we have uh, movies, movies trash, trash. Check your doctor. Oh. Like the trash? Yeah, where's the... Uh, it's, it should be on the very bottom of your doc. It's at the very bottom of this thing? Of your doc. The is that the is that what it does? The dock is the thing that pops up. That's so this is this is why I prefer the command line. Where, where is this thing? This is Spotlight. If you go to the dock on your left hand side, oh, right the dock on so the right hand side part. Yeah. This thing. The thing that pops up on the very bottom, you'll see a little trash can on the right. Ah. Okay. Yeah. There we go. And then there we Bacon's go. Bacon's in there. And then bacon is right there. So that's how everyone else does it. If you want to do the point and click method, and then there's our bacon. Cool. Alright, let's close that out. And let's go back. Okay, make a big game. In general, you should always send a trash, send a trash. That's of course not true. You should always risk losing all of your files and do it like RM and unlink, like God intended. Uh, okay. As they say, safety third. Walking a directory tree. Say you want to rename every file in some folder and every file in every subtree of that folder. That is, you want to go through the directory tree, touching each file as you go. Writing a program to do this can get kind of tricky. Fortunately, Python provides a function to handle this process for you. Okay, this is kind of cool. We talked about this, this need here to recurse in earlier, right? So when you recurse in, you're telling the computer, go into every directory I find, process the folders, if one of those, process the files, rather, and if one of those files is another directory, go inside it and process those. And you keep repeating that process, right? So the process is examine all the files. If one of them is a directory, go inside it and examine all those files. And if any of them are directories, go inside it. And then that's the process of recursion. You have to, you know, file or directory, if directory, go inside and start over. What we do here is we're looking at this tree that we have. And let me see if I can make that small. We're looking at this tree that we have. And what you're going to see is that we have this function called os.walk. And this does all of that for you. So all you have to do when you walk a directory, with uh, walk a tree with os.walk, is you have to tell Python, when you find a file, do this. That's it. Then you just give it the location of wherever you want to start, and Python does all of that work of recursion, right? So the recursion concept is something we don't teach in this class at all. Right? It's, in fact, I think even in chapter zero, I think they start off with that. They go through the concepts that we will not be covering. Recursion is one of them. And we use this os.walk to totally skirt this. Right? So we say here, with os.walk, we just say import os, four folder name, subfolders, file name, and os.walk, and then here's the base. Right? This is where we're going to start that search and see delicious. So each time we go through this, right, os.walk, is going to return one of those tuples. You guys remember the tuples? We covered that earlier. I'll show you that again. For those of you that want to recap on that, here's the tuple. We have uh, A equals, oh, nope, nope. Try again. A equals, and uh, then let's say here, hello, one, and then we can even do uh, 4.123. Okay? That's a tuple. Now if I want to look at A, it tells me there that it's what it equals. And here's the catch. We can actually assign that tuple to three different variables, right? I could say here, uh, foo bar baz equals A. Now if I look at all of these types of things, you're going to see that they're set. 
And we went through this when we covered tuples. That was ages ago at this point. So what I want you to see is that that is exactly all that's happening right here. OS.walk is returning a tuple. Inside of that tuple, we have folder name, subfolders, file names. Right? And then that's it. So each one of those represents one thing it found. We should expect file name or subfolder or folder name to change each time. We'll never get the same call with all three of those the same. So all you're doing is saying, I want you to take care of all of that work of the file system. I want you to call me when you find something. And when you call me, have these three pieces of information in hand. So then when we do that, it says here, the current folder is, and we say folder name. And then we say for subfolder in subfolders, right? Print subfolder of is a string, folder name, colon subfolder, right? What are we doing here? Okay, let's go back and let me show you that other example. Okay, so we talked about here how we could have a tuple with three things in it, right? And in this case, all three of those, all three of those things, string, number, float, all three of those things represent one value. But a tuple could also be this. I could do a equals. Right? Now if I go back up and I use the same code I did before, foobar baz equals A, and I look at bar, I see one, two, three. Now this should make sense, right? I could just say for value in bar, right? Print value, and I get my one, two, three out. So what does that tell us about this, what we're looking at right here, okay? It tells us right here, this subfolder, this here, subfolders rather, I'm sorry, subfolders with an S, that this is a list. So os.walk is a tuple with three things in it. A folder name, which we know is a string. We know it's a string because we're concatenating it with another string. And remember what happens when you try to concatenate strings and numbers? You get an error, right? So we know that folder name is a string. And we know that subfolders here is an array. I mean a list, I'm sorry, Python talk. It's a list. And we know it's a list because we can say here for subfolder and subfolders, right? So we can iterate through that too. So we're, we're essentially, we're iterating through each different thing OS walk returns. And then we're iterating inside of that for each different subfolder in the array that OS walk returns. Okay? Now we have here four file name and file names, right? Print file inside, folder name, file name, and then we print the empty strip. Okay, this is the same thing, right? So folder name is a string, subfolder, right, is an array, a list, file names is a list. Yes? Um, earlier you when you were talking about what OS Walk does, um, it <laughs> sounded like you were saying that it uh, traversed the entire directory tree um, and then returned. Um, is that the case, or does it, um, or does it, does it return like an iterator? That, uh, it returns an iterator. Oh, so, so it doesn't, it doesn't traverse the entire directory tree in the beginning before doing anything. Exactly. It, it will give you one file at a time. That is exactly right. Okay. Yep. It's an iterator. <clears throat> almost everything in Python is an iterator. It's almost the, that's an important distinction. And do, you, do you know other programming languages? Do you, what do you come from, if you don't mind me asking, do you have a predominant one? Uh, lately, lately it's been C sharp. I see. I see. Which so is there, it's an iterator. Sure, right. So in Python, unless you explicitly cast the generator to a list, everything is a generator. Except for the range function, right? Nope, even that. But you have to use xrange in order to be a generator. Nope. I mean, maybe in Python too, but in oh, Python. Python 3. Yeah. Right, so if I say here like range, what, let me show you what he's talking about. He's saying here, if I say range 5, right, I get this thing range 0 to 5. That is a generator technically. If I want to get the, the numbers 0 through 5, I actually say list range 
five. All right, now I get the list. So he's asking about the distinction here between actually having a list and having a generator. Now what's kind of cool is, and we're not gonna cover this in too much detail, but I am gonna cover it just briefly because it is kind of nice to know it. When we showed that code, right, and I'm gonna show you this here, because sometimes we can make questions which are more advanced, a learning opportunity for everyone. We see here OS walk, right? Now think about when you're implementing OS walk. We will not be implementing OS walk. There's two ways we can do it. One way we can do it is we can say, I want to do all of my work now. And then when I'm done with my work, I want to give you the result of my work, right? Now that makes sense because it's a clean division of tasks, right? Cleanly, I'm done, you start. The problem with that is if you have a directory and it has 100 million files in it, you have to do a lot of work. Because you're gonna have to go through each one of those files and say, are you a directory, should I go inside? Are you a directory, should I go inside? You could be there for a while waiting for os.walk to finish if you implemented it that way. The other way you can implement os.walk is to say, give me one file, then I'll do my work. Then you give me another file, then I'll do my work. And that way you're balancing your work out and you're not needing os.walk to do all of that work at the beginning, right? So os.walk is technically an iterator. It's going to give you something back that allows you to grab its work and then tell it, I want you to do more work and give me something else. And all of that happens under the hood. All right. I feel like that's a really shitty introduction to iterators, but we're not gonna touch that in this class beyond it. So, moving on. Uh, <laughs> we have, uh, so here, os.walk function is passed a single string value, the path of a folder. You can use os.walk in a for loop statement to walk a directory tree, much like you can use the range function, there you go, exactly, <coughs> to walk over a range of numbers. Unlike range, the os.walk function will return three values on each, you know, each iteration of the loop, right? So what they're saying, three values, is right here, folder names, subfolders, and file names, it's actually returning that tuple that we showed earlier. And I tried to show you how that worked, because that's something that I think can, I can help make the book bigger on. Uh, a string of the current folder's name, a list of strings of the folders in the current folder, and a list of strings of the files in the current folder, right? So os.walk is going to return once for each folder with all that stuff in it. Just like you can choose the variable name i in the code i range to 10, we've already seen that, going down, okay. So you can see here how it runs, right? When you run this program, it'll output the following. The current folder is C Delicious, subfolder of C Delicious is cat, subfolder of C Delicious is walnut, file inside is spam. Right, now you can see here it's moving, and now it's inside of cats. So before, it was telling us inside of delicious, we have this subfolder cats, but now it's telling us the current folder is cats, right? So you can see os.walk did something. It changed directories from delicious into delicious cats, right? And then what does it find? It says file inside, yeah, I'm not gonna touch that one. File inside, file inside, see delicious cats? Cat name and Zofi. Okay, they are gone. The current folder is C Delicious Walnut. So now you can see here, let's go up. What we did is we had a directory, we gave it C Delicious. Inside of that, we had two different subfolders, cats and walnuts. We actually went and crawled through cats here, and we crawled through walnuts here. See how that works? And then we find this other one inside of walnuts. We have another directory called waffles, so we go into that. So each time, walk is going into a different folder and telling you more about it and its contents. Okay. <coughs> this is your own custom code. Okay, yeah, not doing that. Compressing files with a zip file module. Okay. So, before we touch the zip file module, Let's go ahead and uh, break for pizza because they're here. I hope everyone is eating a non-pineapple pizza. If you like pineapple, then I'll be nice. I'll let you off easy this time. All right, welcome back. I hope you all enjoyed lunch, unless you were eating pineapple pizza. 
In which case, you know my sentiments? <laughs> I hope you're no longer with us. <laughs> uh, Okay, so we have, uh, we just now finished up doing this idea of walking through directories, and essentially what we're doing in that is we're telling Python, give me a heads up when you find a new directory, and when you find a directory, tell me all the subdirectories that are inside of it, all the files that are inside of it, and where the hell you're at. And then Python takes care, <coughs> Python takes care of all the, the gory work. It essentially, it just gives you the heads up and calls your code. So now what we're going to be doing is we're going to be doing stuff with zip files, right? So, uh, you can see here, right off the top, that we're going to be using a zip file module, which means installing the zip file module, right? So I'm going to do this, and we're going to go back over it. So to install a module, I'm going to use pip. Now, if you're using Linux, you may find that as pip3. If you don't know whether or not you're using Python 2 or Python 3, Heads up, you should always figure this out because some systems install both and you don't want to be programming with the wrong language. If you type in dash dash version, generally speaking, no matter what you're working with, it will tell you the version that you're working with, right? So here you see at the very bottom, Python 3.7. That means I'm using pip, pip is using Python 3.7. That is the same thing as pip 3. OS X just drops a 3. Okay. So we want to install the zip file thing. So we're going to do pip uh, install dash dash user and then zip file. That's it. Could not find a version that satisfies the requirement of zip file from versions of matching distributions bound for zip file. Oh, shit. Yeah, bleep that one out. You can download this zip file from, okay, we have that. Okay. That I wasn't expecting. Hold on a second. Import zip file. Aha. It doesn't have to be downloaded. It's either, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a module that ships with Python. Okay. So we learned something. Because we always learn stuff when we make mistakes. The zip file module, unlike the Piperclip module, and unlike the other module, which we just installed, right? does not have to be installed. It comes with Python. So we don't have to do anything. The other module we just installed was that, was it trash to uh, delete file to remove to trash? <coughs> remove to trash. The remove to trash module we had to install. The Piper Clip module made the clipboard modification we had to install. This we don't have to install. It's like OS, it's just more specific. Okay, so we can go into Python 3, and I can say import zip file and it works, and I can say help zip file. And what that will tell me is everything about a zip file. So if you want to become an expert in zip files, this is how you do it, right? A lot of this stuff is way beyond the scope of what we're going to be doing today, but we may go back to it. So come back over here, and you'll see what we're doing. First step we're going to be doing is reading a zip file, right? Now I go up here and put shout out they have uh, an archive online for this thing where they have all of the code and all of the code samples. And if you don't have that on your computer, you may want to get it, right? And it has made my life a lot easier ever since I stopped live coding and I just used their code. Because live coding is less fun than it looks. And I know it looks painful. Uh, so the thing here is you can, you can grab that code online. And if you grab that code online, what we're going to be doing is looking inside for this thing called example.zip, right? So Having grabbed it online, what I'm going to do is come back. We're going to get out of that, and I'm going to go here to downloads. Nope. Downloads. By the way, the dot dot means I'm going up a directory. We learned that in the last class, right? That's the computer language for up. <laughs> And uh, we're going to go into downloads, and then I'm going to look for this automated boring stuff, the Python materials, which they call that. Uh, now, if I want to clear all that crap and move my cursor up to the top, I just hit clear, and boom, we're up at the top. And now I can see what we have inside, right? So you'll see here what we have in store for us. We're doing some stuff with PDFs later on. We're doing some stuff with spreadsheets later on. Uh, you'll see all that stuff in future classes. But what we're looking for today is example.zip right there. And you will see it 
to be opening that file up and taking a look at it. So let's go back here, dig, come down, read zip files, and here's our code. Let's go through the code. So right off the top, we're importing zip file, which is that new module that we already have as part of Core Python. We're importing zip file, we're importing a file, uh, the module OS, we've seen that before, that's the one that provides that path name feature, where we can do the relative and absolute path names. We are jumping into the directory C drive. We will not be doing that in ours, but you see on the right-hand side, that thing that starts with a pound sign, that is our comment. We don't process that, it's just a note to us, to programmers. He's moving into the folder with zip, okay? So my folder is not C drive because I'm not using Windows. I'm using OS X, which is worse. Uh, and I'm gonna take it and I find example zip, and in order to do that, I use zip file dot zip file, and I give it example dot zip, right? So this feature here, we have a module zip file. And in that module zip file, we have a method zip file. Now, the astute will notice that the Zs are different. They have different caps. That is by intent, right? Uh, modules are always lowercase in Python. Method names are sometimes lowercase, but not always. So this guy is always going to be lowercase, even if all of the marketing spiel and googly goop is uppercase, usually. That's the way it tends to be with Python, or so I see. Uh, so what we're doing here is we're saying, I want to create a new zip file, example.zip, or open a zip file. Then what I'm doing is I'm saying name list. What is name list returning? It's returning spam.txt cats, cats, and cat. Something other with cats. Notice no bacon. The author's diversifying. I like it. <laughs> spam info. Now we're saying example.zip, get info, spam.txt, and what is it telling you? So we have, a, let's go through some objects here, right? This zip file.zip file. Right? This is taking an argument, example.zip, right? And it's returning something. <clears throat> this thing it's returning is an object, right? How do we know it's an object? Everything's an object. That's a good answer, but it's also a smart ass answer. We know it's an object, <laughs> and, and we like smart ass answers because they're usually more correct than no answer, which is everyone else. <laughs> so what we have here is example.zip, and example.zip we're calling a method, name list, right? So you can't call a method on something that's not an object. So example.zip has to be an object, right? So we know when we call a zip file, we're getting back an object, that represents the zip file. Now what does that look like? That looks like how we did the file system earlier, right? We call open, we get a file object back. On that file object, we can call read and write, okay? So example zip in this case is just like a file object, the only difference is it's a zip object, right? So you call open, you get a file object, you call from the zip file, this method called zip file, right? And you get back, a zip object. That's your pattern. That's, I want you to see the pattern because there's really not much shit we can take away from this boring stuff. Stuff. So if we got to know that pattern so we can start making sense of things. Randy, what is an object? Object. They're, they're, Good question. A, an object has data and that the thing that defines the data, right? What 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 is that another word? Sure. What so, is that other word? So here's. Here's what an object is, right? For the purposes of this, and by the way, we can we can we can be somewhat satisfied that I, I won't be overly corrected on this because the real question is how do you, how do you need to think of objects at this stage? Not where would you be thinking of objects if you had a PhD in, in computer science? What you need to think of is an object, right? An object holds something inside of it, and that thing that it holds inside of it is important. We call that state, and it can be anything. For your purposes, it's just data. It's a fancy way of saying data. The difference between that those two words is the object holds it inside. So there's something special about that, right? When we call zip file dot zip file, we're giving it example dot zip, and it's never forgetting it. That's what you're constructing this thing with. It has this as an argument. That is part of who it is, right? And the object component is that you have this stuff that makes the object the object, which is this state. 
this data that we're using to build it. And then the object itself can do things, right? So it can do something. And those things that it can do, you get out of that object by calling a method, right? So in the object-oriented paradigm, you say, I need to make a dog. What's the dog's name? What's the breed of the dog? Now you've got a dog. Now what can the dog do? It can bark, it can run, it can move, all those types of things. That's your traditional canonical concept of an object, right? <coughs> Most of the time, when we teach object-oriented programming, we use animals because they're also hierarchical, hierarchical, and that makes sense. But we're not getting into any of that with this. We're keeping it very simple. We're creating an object that represents a zip file, right? And with that object, we can do specific things. Right now, one of those things we need to do with that object is get a list of all of the contents inside of it. And we do that with this method named name list. Okay? So we say example list, example zip dot name list, and it's gonna tell us all of these different things that are inside that zip file. That's one of the things that the programmers who wrote zip file did for us. They taught our zip file how to tell you everything it has inside of it. And all you gotta do is say name list, and it knows how to do the rest of it. That's kind of how this object-oriented paradigm works. So we say we want to get that name list, right? And it's going to give it to us. And we have this other thing now, right? Where we have get info, right? So when we call get info, we give it the element from the name list that we want more information on. And it's going to return spam info. Let's go up here and rephrase. We constructed a zip file object using this. We got our zip file object and we called name list on it. Now we're introduced to a new thing called get info and we give it an argument, this spam.txt, and it returns what is essentially uh, what we would call, a, and there are these things inside of the zip, these files inside of the archive. It's an object that represents that, spam info. Spam info is the file inside of the archive that represents spam.txt. And then from that point, we can say file size, and it's going to tell us what it is. We can say compress size, and it's going to tell us what it is. So we have different objects here. We have the object that represents the archive, example zip, and then we have the object that represents the, the file inside of the archive, right? And these have, we call these attributes. Notice there's no parentheses on this one. And we call these methods. There is a parenthesis on that one. Okay? So, and let's go back to that online help thing. Let's take a look at that. So we have kind of slowed down on live coding because we had some rough spots with it. And live docking has also given us some rough spots. Uh, but let's give it a shot. Help, zip file. because I want to show you how we read this, right? So we have this zip file object is what it's telling us right here, built-in objects. This is what I was talking about. And notice, I never read the docs for this thing. I didn't even know this was a core module. I just look at the syntax, and I see the patterns, and right away these things come, uh, come apparent to me. And it's one of those things that it's, it's relatively important that we, we, uh, we learn those things. Making sure this is on. Okay, so we have here the zip file object and the zip info object, right? Those are those two objects that I, I just picked out and I said we can identify them and I showed you how. Here's our zip file object. We create it by calling zip file .zip file. There's the zip file object. We're saving it to example zip. Here we create a zip info object. How do we do it? We do it by zip file .get info. And then here spam info is our zip info object, right? This may be a little bit more complex, but the only value that I can add to you over just simply reading the book and going through these things is if I kind of try to bring some of it to the table. So if you have any questions, just ask me. But this is definitely more thorough than what the book is showing you, right? Uh, okay, so let's go down here and we're gonna look at some of the other stuff that we have. I'm gonna see if any of it is useful, and this is what I normally do when I get when I get an object, when I get something like this that I want to interact with. If I want to do something with a zip, I'm going to open up the help pages with it, and I'm going to start going through it. Right Now, I know I don't care about the bad zip file stuff, because we don't give it bad zip files, right? 
Large zip files, eh, probably not going to be using that one either, but maybe. Uh, Pi zip file, there we go. Plastic free zip archives with Python library and packages, that may be useful. So here's some of the things that we can do here with zip files. We can call extract on a zip file, right? Now notice what we're expecting here. We give it a path on extract, right? Uh, we also have extract all. So extract all takes the same syntax and extracts all members from the archive to the current working directory. Path specifies a different directory to extract to. Members is optional and must be a subset of list return. So let's parse that. Path is going to be where we're going to send it to, and members doesn't have to be defined at all. Defaults to none. Right? With extract, see how we have this thing in the middle, member? That means extract <coughs> is taking a single file. It's going to get us a single file. They call this file a member. Right? These aren't my words, they're their words. So we'll just accept it. We won't redefine it. Extract all doesn't have the member thing. It defaults to none. And that's because it's going to give you all of this shit in the zip file. Right, so if you want the GUI analog, when you have a zip file on your computer, you double click it, and it dumps all that crap all over your desktop, that's that guy using extract all. And if you've ever seen the GUIs where you can like open the zip drive intelligently, by the way, Mac OS doesn't have this, Linux does it by default, I'm just telling you how much simpler it is, even though people don't believe me. And if you know how to do this with a Mac, you tell me, because I couldn't figure it out this for a day. <laughs> extract, you open up the zip file, you find the zip you want in the zip file, and you can just select the one file and drop it. So you would write something like that, that functionality, with extract. And extract all is what Mac does, where you double click it and it craps all over the place. <laughs> so uh, we have this thing nameless. We've already seen that. That's going to tell us all of the items inside of the zip file, right? We have set password. That sounds like fun. I don't know how effective it is, but why not password everything? Uh, it's, it'll make you look important. Uh, and then we have we have test zip. So if you maybe you have a corrupt zip file and you want to know where the corruption's at, maybe Grandma sent you one that's a little foobart. You can figure it out with that. So this is how you kind of do it. You kind of go in there and you say to yourself, and I'm going through this because people they they say how do we structure a program? You're working with a zip file. This is your module. Go through it and see what you can find. And if you can't find what you need, right, go to Stack Overflow and ask someone smarter. That's what I did. OK. So going back, we get the file size. We have this spam info object, which is representing a member. We now know the name of it, right? So we have a member inside of this archive called spam.txt, and we're calling file size and compress size on it. And then we say compress file is what percentage smaller? Right? And then we use this. We say round, okay. We say round, and I want you to see this is this is rounding, and this is the argument to it right here is the two. Right? So we call round and we take this spam info dot file size divided by the compressed size. Right? So we take the file size on the top, right, which is the original number, the bigger number, and the compressed size on the bottom, which is the smaller number. Divide it out, and then we want to round it to two digits, and we get 3.63 times smaller. So this is going to go through a zip file. It's going to tell you how big, how what the compression ratio is of spam.txt. Okay. Extracting from zip files. Import zip file in OS. We're going to see what that does. We are going into the root directory, C drive. We're saying here example zip equals zip file dot zip file example zip. That sounds really redundant, and it is, but module method, argument, zip file object. Zip file object, method, extract all, right? Crap all over the desktop like Mac OS. <laughs> Example zip, dot close, and parentheses. It's done, it did its job. Think different. Okay. <laughs> uh, after running this code, the contents of example zip will be extracted Oh, I have this thing up here. I don't know what that is. After reading this code, the contents of the examples that will be extracted to C drive. Optionally, you can pass a folder name to extract all to have it extract all the files into a folder other than the current working directory. That's not all that much better in my opinion. But yeah, so it'll crap somewhere at least else. Uh, if the folder passed the extract all method does not exist, it will be created. Okay? So that's really cool, you know? Uh, 
And yeah, so that's slightly more sane. So now you can say example zip dot extract all, and you give it where you want to dump that stuff too, right? So you say I need a zip file object that represents the zip file. Now you're going to just say dump that zip file in this, this location, and then you, there you can see the example of it. Uh, no, this is something totally different. Okay. So moving on, the next piece of code we have example zip dot extract, and in this case we're saying what we want spam dot txt. Now that's kind of cool, right? So now we can say if you have, let's say you have a thousand zip drives and you want to get one file, a, a thousand zip files, you want to get one file out of the, each one of those thousand zip files, right? On OS X, you'd have to go, let me just tell you how bad it would be. You'd have to go through each one of those thousand zip files and have them crap over the current directory you're in. You'd have to take the file you want out of that directory. You'd have to delete all of the other files in that directory, rename the one you wanted, and then move to the next one so it could crap all over the directory, rename that one, delete all the other files it did, and you have to produce that thing every time. This is why automate the boring stuff is really cool, right? Because that's, that's pretty simple. I said it in one sentence. You have a thousand zip files, you want to extract the same file from each one. Ideal computer program. We're doing it here. We, this assumes that we've already got the, the zip file, right? But we just call zip file.extract, and we tell it which one, and it extracts it there, right? Now, if we wanted to rename it, we could do that. How would we do that? We would use that shell module we saw earlier we call rename on it, right? Because that shell module is the one that provided rename. So we, we went through that, and we went through the difference between move and rename, and I, or move and copy. Move is what they call it, right? We, I, I said explicitly, move deletes the original, puts it in the, the new place, copy, gives you two different copies. So if you wanted to just copy that file out or move that file out, you could do that using those other modules we learned about earlier. The OS module and that, that uh, shell module. Okay. So, when we're done with it, we say close, and we move on to the next task. And where are we on time? We're halfway through this thing, and we are two-thirds of the way through the class. Evan, is there a reason why, is your, are your fonts, is your screen too small on your MacBook Pro? Is your you're gesturing with the screen like never before, like a lot more than you were before. Uh, like in other words, instead of showing it on the computer and highlighting things, uh -huh. you're you're going to the computer. You know, you're you have a whole, all the. You got me all excited when you show my face. Up you have there, a whole new stuff. Just, well, I had to. Know, I, had I know to this is going to show code, but yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, I was showing you the program out for a little while, but somebody said hey, every once in a while you your full screen with just you. Right. And somebody said, ah, oh, we want to just see the code, so I had to. I'm giving you an auxiliary feed right now. I'm going back to the auxiliary feed. I see. So do you want me to do more of it on the computer or more of it in the? Well, it, well, it would look better on the video, but do whatever you want. It would. It would look better. Well, anybody. Are you telling me I'm ugly? Is that what you're saying? No, I'm, just, I'm just saying when you're when you're showing you something. You had a brownie point. You when, just threw it back at me. Well, no, you you have plenty of screen time. Trust me. But when you're selecting something with the mouse and you're saying look at this and you so highlight things with the mouse. Right. That that's very clear. Ah. And it's clear okay. in the class and it's clear on the video. Okay. But I'll when you stand that. in front, of, when you're backlit and you stand in front of the screen, you're pointing at something. Eh, it's okay, but it. I got you. It's not as cool. Right. Ah, okay. Well, we'll do that. That's a good point. Uh, but yeah. do whatever you want. I can roll with the punches. You used okay. to hop back and forth. That was even more interesting. <laughs> I, I can't. Well, you're actually, <laughs> you're actually moving a lot, too. What do I do with this? It's <laughs> you know, a hard life, I'm telling you. Okay. Yeah. Uh, tethered me. That's right. Tethered me. Yeah. Uh, all right. Okay. And I used to, I used to have, I used to, they, they say when you do public speaking, you know, they say, uh, what is it, control the, uh, the po take control of the podium or something like that, they walk, and now here it's like, nope, forget that shit, <laughs> you have three feet or you're out of here. Okay, we have here uh, import zip file, right, so we're taking a zip file, and we say essentially here, new zip, right, new zip is an object, we're saying zip file dot zip file, give me an object, what? <laughs> what is that thing that keeps... <clears throat> someone get me after class and tell me what I'm doing to get that, that crap up. That's a mousey. Okay, zip file to zip file. We're giving it new zip, and we give it this W, right? So we're going to write a zip file this time. What this is going to represent... Yay. How is that useful? It's trying to help. I how is that useful? <laughs> no results. Someone tell me how they thought it's different like on that one. Uh, from Microsoft Office. 
I don't even know what it is. It's actually after a little flipping. I know. I have no idea who thought that was a good idea, but whatever. Okay. So right here we have uh, we have new zip dot new zip dot right right. And newzip.write is taking the, the member name, right? This is something else. It's a file in our directory, right? And what we're doing is we're telling it how we want to compress that, right? So in this case, we're using this thing called zip deflated. This is one possible compression scheme. We're not going to go into what that means, but essentially there's different ways to make files smaller, and deflate is one of them. And then after we add spam.txt to the zip file, we say newzip.close, and we have our zip file that we can send to our grandma. Okay, uh, project. Renaming files with the American style dates to European style dates. Okay, now I will tell you this right now as a programmer, it doesn't matter which one of these you choose, if you choose either one, you're horrible, right? Programmers always write dates without exception, year, 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 dash, month, month, dash, day, day. For sorting. Will, uh, what? For sorting. For sorting. That's exactly <laughs> right. I was going to say that. So what we do is why do we sort that way? Because when you sort with a computer with English collation, that means in America land place, uh, what we do is we look here at the leftmost thing, right? And we say, is this <coughs> bigger than whatever else we're comparing it against? We look at the left character. Are they both A's? If they are, go to the second character. Is one of them an A and one of them a B? If so, the A comes, that's how we do sort. Okay, so when we have here the European style dates, the, the American dates, we do month, day, year. If it is the, what the hell date? It doesn't tell me, does it? There it goes, March 27th. It's March 27th, so we would have 03-27-R year. But in Europe land place, they do 27-03- you know, year. And they're both really crappy for a computer program. So we fix, and I want to say that, I'm, this is not like opinion, but most of my stuff is opinion. Some people really think Macs are better. But when it comes to dates, we have an actual standard for it. So there's a difference, right? That's not just Evan saying it. We have an actual standard where we have said, write dates this way or you're insane. And most of the world follows it. But most of the bosses don't. So that's where you work with that, you know? Okay. So the name of this, and by the way, this is, this is also, okay. I now know what highlighting it does. It's a dictionary. That's better than no results. Okay, when we, have, when we have these dates in this format, this is the one our bosses are giving us in America, right? We're going to convert them to the European style dates. Okay. So we're going to create a regex that can identify the text patterns of American style dates. We're going to call os.lister to find all of the files in the current working directory. We're going to loop over each file name using the regex to check whether it has a date. And if it has a date, we're going to call shutil.move. And we just mentioned it, right? That's the function we learned earlier. Now, here's the thing about regexes, to keep them simple. You will almost always be wrong when you use a regex, right? And I don't mean that to be a smart ass. I mean to say regexes are principally to get a job done, and very seldom are they all inclusive. So you don't want to be the guy that's like, there's an exception here with the regex. Because I guarantee you the one we're using isn't right. So when you look at something like that, just know it. There's usually flaws, but it's, it's just good enough, right? <coughs> so here, uh, we're taking a regex, and you can see here what we're doing. We are, and I'm going to explain this to you, because for those that aren't acclimated with this, it'll help. We import shutil, os, and re. Re is the regex module. Really, for RE, the only thing that you will re need to know off the top of your head, or that you will use all the time, is re.compile, right? So, it, it's cute that I know what it does, but it's not, not all that useful. re.compile, and that's that dictionary thing popping up here. So we take re.compile, and we're gonna give it a raw string that represents the regex, right? So R creates a raw string. What does this do? This makes it easier so you don't have to escape everything. Right? It's essentially saying there are no variables inside this string. Uh, so all of this stuff right, that's inside of this raw string is part of that regex. Right? So let me tell you something else here. Normally a raw string is done with one quote mark. If you look here, you'll see it's done with three quote marks. The book doesn't say this here, but it made mention of it earlier. Three quote marks in Python is a special thing. If you don't come from, if you come from another language, you don't have this. 
But this is actually one of the cooler features of Python. Uh, one of the areas where it improved, and I actually like it a lot, and I wish Perl had it. Uh, you can do three quotes, string, hello world, and you can do it like that. And now look, right, I'm going to show you. We constructed a string up here. Right, we talked about this before. If I do this, one, two, three, I'm constructing a list. If I do this, foo, true, nope. Yeah. Capitalize it. I'm constructing a dictionary, right? If I do this, I'm constructing a tuple. The reason why I want you to get used to that term, I'm building something, right? So if I want to build a, a number, I just type in the number and it knows what it is. If I want to build a string though, right, I have to use quotes, right? So I have to say something like this, hello, or I have to say something like this. These are all different ways to build a string. But in Python, there's another way to build a string. We can use a triple quote and we can say hello. Right? Now, a triple quote gives us an advantage. Notice how each time we're building the same string, right? But the triple quote gives us one advantage. Anyone know what it is? Multiple lines. lines. What's up? Multiple lines. Multiple lines. Mm -hmm. That's a really good one. What's one more advantage? Watch this, okay? If I do this, you can put, hello? You can put funny characters in. Well, you can put funny characters in the other ones, too. <laughs> yeah. That's going to blow your world. Hello, yeah. world. Right, like this. Now, what do you see? I put both a single character and a double quote character mm -hmm. inside of that string. I don't have to worry about it. So for you to screw this one up, right? for your user to screw this kind of stuff up, they have to put three quotes inside of their shit, or you don't have to worry mm -hmm. about it. That's not something you typically find unless the person you're working with is malicious, <laughs> right? And if the person you're working with is malicious, it becomes a security issue, right? So this is kind of kind of easier because you don't you don't generally have to worry about three quote sequences ever. It, it, it may happen, but that's what I like about it, right? So what we're doing here is let's cover different things. First thing, uh, yes, okay. So the first thing is it is the only form that accepts multiple lines. If we do this though, our triple quote, we're creating a raw string here that we can span multiple lines all the way down to here, right? And inside of that, we can actually use single and double quotes. So that's what we're doing. I just want to be sure that we know that the triple quotes here and they are, this is not part of the regex, right? Okay, so this is where the regex, <laughs> there are no quotes inside here. I'm sorry, I'm gonna, <clears throat> that's the. Accessibility option, turn it off. I don't know. Is with that, that under access? Hold on. Someone teach my Mac how to not be a Mac. I've never had that happen before. No, not the window. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Trackpad. Trackpad options. What, track? First open system preferences. Okay. Trackpad. No. Under. Go into the. Sure. Right there. That sure. works. Yeah. yeah. Accessibility. No. no trackpad. Trackpad. trackpad? No. Okay. Uh, yeah, trackpad. Point, you click, have. point and click on the top. And then it's the top one. Look up data detectors. Okay. Cool. Of course, that's cool. I love that. I, I, that's, I, I, let me see. <laughs> that's wonderful. It's sane again. Okay, great. So here. So let's get back to explain this regex, and then we can later list about how my Mac is now acting, you know, normal. We, we start here with a beginning character, right? This is what this is. It literally tells the regex, start at the beginning of the string. Right, that's what the caret means. Right? So we're, we're saying start at the beginning of our string, and then what I want to do is I want to get all of the text before the date. So we went through this, we talked about it briefly. Ed covered the class on regexes. We had this question mark here. This question mark means not greedy. Right? So the question mark means we're going to start copying characters. We're going to take characters one at a time right, until we match the rest of this stuff that we have here. Right? So take one character, do I match this stuff? If not, take another character, do I match this stuff? If not, keep going. Until we get to the end and we can't match that shit, and then we fail. So what we do here is we, we, we start, and what are we looking for, right? Let's look at this regex. This is part of it, right? We're looking for a zero or a one, and we need to have zero or one of them. At most, one, right? And then we have to have one more digit. 
So right here, this is how they're saying it. One or two digits for the month, right? Now we have one, two, or three digits for the day. How do we do that? Right, right here. We have zero, one, two, three, question mark. Why do we stop at three? Because no months have 40 days, right? So this isn't perfect because no months technically have 39 days either, but our regex will accept that. But we say 40 days would be insane. And that's kind of how regexes by and large work. You can do later verification later. It's totally fine to not have it on the regex. So we, the, the first digit of the month, right, has got to be the first digit of the day, 0, 1, 2, or 3. Then we look for one more digit, right? Then we're coming down here and we're looking for anything in the 19th or 20th century. Notice we're leaving out the 18th, 17th, and all the other shit. So we say start with 19 or 20 and then look for two more digits right here. All right? And then we say everything else at the end. So we have this which is matching the beginning, right up here, this thing. This says everything at the beginning until we start matching all of this stuff right here. And then after we have matched all of this stuff, I want to capture everything else at the end. All right? And then you can see what he says later he wants to do. Loop over the files in the working directory, skip files without a date, get the different parts of the file name, form the European style file name, get the full and absolute paths, rename the files. And that's, by the way, not a bad idea. When you're scaffolding, we call this scaffolding. You're scaffolding on a program, you can write about your program flow like this, right? You know, and some people even do this, to do. I've seen professional programmers that literally scaffold all their stuff out with to do. Okay. Uh, from this chapter, you know that shutil.move is the what we're going to use to rename this stuff. Okay, easy enough. Okay, so you can see here what we're doing is we're looking for dates like this. Spam 4-4-1984, right? This is month, day, year. And something like this. Month, day, year, eggs.zip, right? Should be renamed while file names like littlebrother.epub can be ignored. Why are they ignored? They're ignored because if we come up here and we never match this middle part of the pattern, which we require, then this is never filled out and we're just going to skip it, right? There'll be a line in there that says something like, if you don't match, just jump to the next file. You can use a regular expression to identify this pattern, which we just showed. We use re.compile to create the regular expression. We pass re.verbose for the second argument, and it allows white space and comments in the regex string to make it more readable. Let's go up and let me show you what they're talking about. We have this thing, this triple quote piece here, this raw string. This allows us to have new lines in here, but these new lines are still there, right? So let me come down here, and let me show you what we're doing here. Oh, okay. We have here, if I say here, uh, let's just show you here. R. If I hit enter right now, what are you going to see? Anyone want to take a guess? One line. Two lines. It's going to show you what it's show what what it's displaying, right? So what, it, what it's got here is the raw string up at the top that we're creating has captured a new line at the beginning. Why? Because notice how the regex over here on this side, look at this. And by the way, I am both using my hands and my cursor. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So, so no one can yell at me. The, 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 the raw string up here that we're creating, right? We do not have a new line on this one, right? We literally start right off with the character. But over here at Everland Place, we jump right down. We say hello, world, but mostly Asia, right? So because we have nothing here, we have a new line. Because we have to tell the computer, we hit return. Return puts everything down. That return is a character like all others. And that character is the new line. We went through this before. I just want to make sure everyone remembers it. So we have a return here, hello, and then we have another return, and then I jammed on space a couple of times, and I put world, and then we have another return, and I had jammed on space a couple more times, and I said, but mostly h line. Okay, so we have new line, new line, new line, but mostly h line. If we come over here, right, to this code, whoop, we take a look at this code, 
we see here they have they have this, right? What else do they have? A new line right there. Aha, uh -huh. good question. No. no. They have a comment. Right? Now after the comment, what do they have? A new line? There you go. I just I I let you review yourself. So yeah, we have here, we're creating a raw string, right? <clears throat> we're starting off with a carrot, which says the regex starts now, and it starts at the beginning of the string. We're matching this crap. Then we have a space. The space is not significant. Does it matter? And then we have a pound sign, meaning this is a comment. And then we go through and we have all of this shit right here. None of that matters to the regex. You can delete it. Then we have a new line somewhere over here because we're jumping back over here. We have spaces. Look at all this stuff right here, right? They don't matter. It's not part of the regex. It's not in the date. Then we have at the end, we have, this is our one or two digits for the month. We have the dash, right? Because we do month, dash, day, dash, year. So this is that dash. We have all these spaces here. We have another pound representing a comment and all this crap that we don't need to have. And then we have another new line at the end. So you can see all of this stuff that is not part of the regex, the new line and the comments, something has to get rid of it, right? And that's what this guy does right here, re.verbose. Re dot verbose is something you can pass to regex.compile and it says clean this up. You're gonna get a string with all this crap in it, but clean it up. Let me show you what that string looks like. I'm gonna copy this, right? And by the way, one thing I hate about this book is the fact that I think these threes are actually characters. Let's try this. I'm copying that string, right? Now you can notice this is just the string, this is not the regex, right? Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to get out of my full screen mode. Uh, I'm going to, let's try pasting it. Did that work? It did. Okay, so I take that back. The, the thing does not copy it. What I, want to, what I want to show you here is this. This is exactly what I wanted to show. <coughs> when I paste this, this, this stuff, this is exactly what I just copied from the book, right? And I hit enter, I get all of this stuff right here. Do you see that? So this is where I stopped, and let me highlight the lines for someone that's on me about this. Okay, I highlight the lines, and what I see here is that all of this stuff down here, this is what we're passing to regex compile, right? So if I wanted to get rid of that R, that raw string thing, I could type in all of this exactly like that with these new lines, right? I could type that in manually. And I could send that to regex compile and it would work, so long as I use re.verbose. Does that kind of make sense to you? Did I lose anyone in that? Okay, I'm trying to show that we have new lines and they're actually in this string. That's what R is returning. And we can provide this as a regex right here. We can provide this as an input to regex.compile if we have re.verbose. So that's what re.verbose is doing. Okay. The question the yes the four spaces is that just to because this is a program Python programmer writing it that wants new Python programmers to recognize four spaces the spaces are their style yeah that's exactly right he's just yeah. doing that for style yes so the question was do the spaces here actually matter and the answer is no they do not matter because when you start a raw string, right, let's show you both of them here so we can actually see it. Because learning how to play and to relearn this stuff when you forget it is highly important. If I say this, R, and I say hello, world, that will work. But I could also do this, R, hello, four spaces, world, and that also works. So the first time, I have no spaces in this line, right? There's no spaces here. And the second time, when I put the spaces in here, I got them here. The answer to your question is, the raw string piece doesn't care, Python formatting doesn't care, and re.verbose is gonna fix it if you do it. It's a coincidence that the four spaces coincides with the normal indent convention. Python. That, that's exactly, that's exactly right. Good. I'm glad to know you. We have people following at 100%. Okay. 
So, we now know how that regex works. And I think in this book they teach you how to think about regexes, which is the only reason why I'm not going to cover that slightly more. Dun, dun, dun. Identify the, there, okay, speak of the devil. Identify the parts of the regex, right? So we just matched all of these different things, and I told you what they, they were, like a way to think about them. Well, here's where we actually, after we match the regex, notice we have here uh, for a merit file name, that's the American file name from our bosses, in the, the directory that we have, we're gonna do date pattern dot search, right? So we have this thing, let's go up here. Notice, we're saving this regex as date pattern, okay? So the re.compile takes that big long ugly string and it returns a regex object, right? We can refer to that regex object from then on with just a pattern. So the book is going to just drop this out of subsequent examples. We're not going to keep seeing it, right? So when you come down here to this, you'll notice he says snip, right? That means there's stuff in there that he's no longer showing you, okay? So let's look down there and find out what he's not showing us. If we see right here, date pattern dot search, he doesn't define date pattern anywhere. That's because he snipped it out. That is that big regex we just saw. So we do date pattern, which is that regex object, right? Dot search, and then we give it a mere file name. That's our file name. And what do we get back, right? We get back an object representing that, the, the, what it found, right? And we say, if what it found is non-contending, okay? This is that part that I was just talking about. When we looked at those different example file names and we said, if you see a file like this, do something. If you see a file like this, do something. But if you see other types of files, skip it. That's where we're doing it. This is what that logic looks like. That, that, that logic looks like. So we say MO, that equals the result here. And if it equals none, we didn't find anything, skip it. Now here's what we're assigning to a group. We say before part, month part, day part, year part, after part. And we're just picking these up, one after another from the group. And every language does it pretty much like this. mo.group1, .group2, .group3, .group6, .group8, right? Now, why did we skip three, four, five, and we go right to six and right to eight? Uh, I think we get to that in here. OK. And here's your answer for it, right? When you think about regexes and you see parentheses, and those parentheses are not escaped, you can mentally think that's a grouping. There's something significant about that, right? So that significance can be different. In this case, we see that the first one we capture is this, and the significance of it is it's all text before the date. The second group that we capture is one or two digits for the month, right? And the third group is one of those digits. Right? We don't go through that in this because it's not useful. It's called a subgroup. Right? So the reason why the subgroup isn't useful is let's go back up to the regex. Let's take a look at it so we can see one. We have this here. This whole thing is useful that I'm highlighting. That's what we want. But when we say right here one or two digits for the month, and we say the month has to start with zero or one, that's not useful. Right? Because in no way it doesn't matter. The only thing that, that that number would tell you is whether or not you're in month 10 or 11, right? Because there is no month 12 because we start at zero. So it's going to tell you whether or not you're in November or December. It's not useful. So this isn't useful. This isn't useful here either, right? Because that's just going to tell you the first digit of the day. But the whole thing is useful because it's going to tell you the day, right? Over here, this isn't useful. This is going to tell you the century. But this is useful because it's going to tell you the year. So that's why we skip those numbers when we come down and we see it. One is useful. Two is useful. Skip three, not useful. Take four, skip five, take six, skip seven, take eight. Come up here. Take one. And then we say take two, skip three, take four, skip five, right here, take six which is here, the, uh, this thing right here. And then we say skip seven, which is right here. Take eight, which is right here. And then we come down and we have the same thing. Okay, so now we have all of the different parts that we need, right? 
And now what we're going to do is we just have to reassemble those parts. And what we're going to do here is right here. So we saw this piece earlier. This is the OS.Path module, right? And the OS.Path module is how we can build an object that represents a path, right? And that object is a string. So we can say right down here, os.path.join, and we give it where we want to go. And then we give it the file name that we want it to be. So how do we do that? Absolute working directory equals os.path.absPath. Right? What is that going to do? That's going to tell me right wherever, whatever directory I'm in. Right? Now let me tell you right now, if I saw this code, I would probably be like, what the hell? Because that doesn't make much sense for me. There, is no real reason why that doesn't just say get CWD. I think that's actually a typo in the book. Because we've already learned that function, right? Get CWD gets you the working directory. Does anyone in here know why they're doing this, Robert? Am I missing something? OS.path.axpath. Why is that not get CWD? Yeah, I don't know. Anyway, <laughs> uh, so yeah, that's the same thing. It's just a more cryptic way of writing what we've already learned and he taught us. Yes? You have an idea? Am yeah. I missing something? Maybe um, maybe it was maybe it used to be a different directory at one point in time, and then it was changed later, and then they were too lazy to update. I don't know. I don't know. I'd have to see a test case for that one. But uh, the thing about getcwd is it's going to tell you wherever you're at, right? It'll tell you whatever directory you're in. And the dot represents whatever your directory you're in. Yeah, I understand that. But if it was, if at one point it was dot dot cats, um, then it would have given you the absolute directory, the absolute path of the cats directory. Um, but uh, then maybe they changed it to just dot. Um, dot dot and path used to be the root directory. So my only thought is it could make a difference if it's a simile. You know, like if maybe the current director is a simile or uh, I don't know. Marco. Um, apps path returns a directory in which the code is in which the code file is stored, but CWD gives you the current working directory, which is by default where the code was executed. So if you're executing it in a different ah, branch, so, yeah. That's right. That's it. Marco, you're the man. I'm a genius. I didn't look that up in Stack Overflow. You definitely. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's an interesting difference. So, so, I mean, there you go. It tells you that you can sometimes never look at it as such. So let's, let's go over what he just said and what that means, right? When you execute code, you have the directory you executed the script in, right? And then you have the directory which the script can be found in, right? They don't have to be the same thing. And that's what I was just assuming that isn't true. So let's go through that one more time and show it, because the author is definitely right, and I'm definitely wrong on that one. We have here, if we do, what in the hell just happened? OK, there we go. OK, yes, I'm floating. OK. Uh, what we're going to do here is I'm going to take it, and I'm going to show you this. If I do this, right, exactly that, ls. If I go here into make dir test, nope, make dir test, cd test, and then I go here make dir, right, and then I have inside of my directory, I have a directory called foobar, right? Now I'm going to go into foobar, and what I want to do is I want to edit a file called test.py, and I'm going to say here print, no, nope, import os, and I'm going to say print os.path.appspath. Print os.getcwd. Yes. Okay. Live coding may work for me. You can see here, when I run both of these inside of the same thing, right, getting the absolute path and getting the current working directory, when I'm inside the same directory with the script, right, I get the same output. Right? But here's the difference. If I go out of directory, and now I have to say python foobar test.py. <laughs> 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 nice. I just realized my explanation was leaving something out. 
Yeah. <laughs> I want everyone to bring a tomato for Marco next time. <laughs> Thanks, buddy. Okay. Marco, finish the rest of that sack. Go overflow pose. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't it? I will look this up later. The point here is that I didn't know originally what it was, and what Marco said sounded extremely intelligent and clarified things to me in a way that not even the Python programmers understood. So we will uh, we will later revisit that, and we will find out what is the difference between these. I was going to say it shouldn't make a difference because dot represents the current working directory, and you're telling it basically do the same thing. It's almost like it's an alias for one another. I was assuming the dot was relative to the script, but that is clearly not the case. For Marco's that Marco was telling me earlier. That's what I was assuming. I was assuming get CWD would be where I'm executing the code, and the dot would be relative to the script. But that is not the case. They are both relative to where you're executing the code. Therefore, my original contention of what in the hell is he doing is still valid. Okay. Uh, so I take back that you know I, I don't. Or figured or out that. Yeah. Coding doesn't have to be miserable. It can sometimes be confounding and fun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> humiliating. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, if you're I, I, I lack the sense of dignity to be humiliated. If you're coder, it's confounding and fun. If you're, if you're not a coder, then confounding is not fun. So I see. Well, you'll, <laughs> get there, you'll get there one day. God is a comedian playing to an audience too afraid to laugh. Okay. So we have here, get the full and absolute paths, os.path uh, dot, right? Then we have the absolute working directory. And what we do is we say os.path dot join, and we give it the absolute working directory. And then we give it an emmer file name, right? So the emmer file name thing, that is whatever file we find. So what we're doing here is we're creating our original name, right? The name of the file we're at, we're creating that. That name exactly, the absolute path of that file. And then we're creating an absolute path to the file that we're going to save. So we create up here a new name for the file. We're saying, OK, we've broken apart that file in different parts. Now we're going to reassemble them like the European Brexiters want. And now what we're going to do is we take our original file, and we get the absolute path of that file. And then we go and we try to move it to the new European file name, right? So we rename files, print. Renaming S, which is string, we went through this too, print. Uh, we're saying rename this thing to this thing. And our first thing is a mer file name, and our second thing is zero file name, right? So we're renaming the American file name to the European file name. And after we do it, which we do right here, or before we do it, we're telling you what we're doing, right? So we say print renaming, and then we call shutil.move. And Bob's your uncle. You're done. Okay. Ideas for simpler programs. There are many reasons why one might want to rename a large number of files. To add a prefix to the start of the file name, such as adding spam underscore to rename eggs.txt to spam.egg, spam underscore eggs. To change file names with European styles to American styles to remove zeros from. I think we just read that, didn't we? Didn't we just read that? I think that was actually verbatim from a different part of the same book. Okay, so the next one that we're going to be doing here is we're going to be backing up a folder into a zip file, right? So this is where you're trying to create your own archiving script, which is a fun practice, but you should never trust your own programming for your own backing up, because if you're foolish enough to lose it for the first time, you're probably too foolish to back it up. So rely on other people to do that. But here's how you would do it. Figuring out the zip's file name, right? We create this thing called backup.zip, and in that backup.zip, we give it a folder name. Right? So what we're doing here is we're creating a zip to backup through this function we're going to create called backup to zip. Right? So we're creating a function called backup to zip. It's going to take a directory and it's going to back it up to a zip file. So here's how you pass in that argument. You pass it in as a folder, right? We've all seen the function syntax. We remember it, right? Anyone have any questions about it? Give me a shout. Okay. So you give it a folder, and we say here, folder equals os.path.absolutepath.folder. So what if you give it a relative name for the folder? You can't assume it's an absolute path. That's really the problem here. So we're not assuming we get an absolute path for a folder name. right? We're accepting that we may get a relative path to a folder name. And if we do, we're going to make it an absolute path. This is 
almost always seen when working with paths. When you talk to users, they always talk in terms of relative paths. You know, it's in my home directory. Well, who the hell are you? You know, if you have three people on the computer, Bob, Mary, and Sue, and they all say it's in my home directory, you know because you're talking to them, but you have to write that down in code. So this is the way the computer translates boss speak into file system speak. We get that, that absolute path. Then what we're doing here is we say number equals one, and we say while true, which is an infinite loop, right? So if it's an infinite loop, an infinite loop you automatically know that somewhere in that loop there has to be a method to break, break out. <laughs> Otherwise, you're not going to get the results you want, and your computer will forever be busy. Then we say here zip file equals os.path.base name, and we give it the folder name. Now notice we got the folder up here, right? So we give it, we, we take a name, we convert it to an absolute name, rewrite it, now we have an absolute folder name. And now what we're doing is we're taking that absolute folder name and we're saying we want to get the base name of it, right? And then we want to add to it underscore string number dot zip, right? So what is this doing? If I give it foo, I get the absolute path to foo, and then what I'm going to have is I'm going to have foo, the absolute path to it rather, foo underscore one dot zip, right? If not os.path exists, file name, that's saying if the file doesn't already exist, break out. If it does exist, increment the number, right? So what we're doing here is we're saying, I want to I want to find the first zip file that I can create to represent this directory. So I think you have a directory and you have five files in it. You run the script the first time, and you're going to get the name of the directory underscore one dot zip. You run it the second time, you're going to get the name of the directory underscore two dot zip, and so on and so forth. Right? You want to always get the next increment that's available. And that's how we're doing it here. We're not actually creating the zip file here. That's just trying to figure out what we can create the zip file as. Then we create the zip file, which remains an exercise to the reader. We'll probably do that later. And then we walk the entire directory tree and we compress the files in each folder, right? So this is what we're going to call os.walk, and then we're going to call zip file dot add or whatever. It's, I don't know if it's dot add, but it'll be something like that. Uh, and then we call at the bottom, back up to zip, see delicious. Now notice we have created a function up here called back up to zip, and we're only ever calling it once with see delicious. So we can call it on however many directories we want, but that's what we're doing here. Okay, so let's take a look at this here because they're introducing this now. This is called the shebang line, right? I don't know if we have one over that so far. So let's give that a shot. The shebang line tells you what kind of script you have that you can execute, okay? Now, for a long time, this was something you couldn't do at all with Windows, and I don't know if they fixed it because I don't use Windows too often. But how it works is like this. With OS X, which is this thing. And with Linux, you can start a file and you put this guy in front of it, right? The hash and the exclamation point. And you will always hear it called shebang. I don't know why, but I'm sure it's sexist and misogynistic. Or that's what I would think. It's shebang. Shebang, but it's S-H-E-B-A-N-G. It's, it's because, because the, it, it's, it's, a, um, it's a short form of hash bang. Can they save a character and they save <laughs> No, it's the just, hash is the short for the shell. Shell bane, so it's executed within the shell. Mm. The hash is short for shell? She said the she is short for shell. Yeah. yeah. The she is short for shell. say that three so times sh fast. Shell bane. <laughs> shell bane, so shebang. Ah, so you're shaving off the L's in shell, and that's how you get shit. Okay, that makes more sense. That's the most innocent definition I could have possibly imagined. For that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that. And I, you know, I actually love computer history stuff. I never knew it, so there you go. Uh, so we have this thing at the top, but these two characters are very special. This actually happens at the kernel, just so you guys know, right? So this is this is this is deep in the bowels of your computer that you, this code is actually sits that processes the the shebang. But it looks for these two characters. These two characters are magical when they're in a text file. And that essentially says, this file is not text. right? Because this file is just like any other file you write. If you take it in a text pad, you say, hello world, blah, 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 blah. And then you have this file, and you say, shebang python, blah, 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 blah. 
They're the same types of things. One of them isn't special. They're both text. And that's the cool thing about Python. The cool thing about Python is if you see a file that ends in .py, you can open it up as Python programmers and look into it. No matter where that file is at. File ends in .py, it's a text file, you can open it up, you can look at it. That's not true with anything else, with everything else, I should say. If you look at something like calc.exe on Windows, you can't open that one up. It's not text, it's special. I'm not going to get into that here, but this is what makes your text different from other text. This is what tells the computer your text is actually code that Python can understand. So it's just called the shebang. So you give it the shebang and you say Python 3. And that's telling you what program can read that text as code. Right? It's still just text, but it's telling you what program it's significant to. And then all of these other lines are just comments. There's nothing special about it. But this line, line up here, it's special. So we scroll down and we say do the basics first, add the shebang line to line one. Okay, now you guys know what that is. Define a backup to zip function that takes just one parameter folder. We just saw that, right? Uh, write a to-do comments for the steps in the source code that remind you to do them later. You don't have to do that. The book likes that. Use a variable named number for n. This is where we're trying to figure out what that new zip file is going to be. And keep incrementing it inside the loop that calls os.path.exist to check to see whether or not the file exists. Keep doing it until the file doesn't exist. Then you have your zip file that you want to save. Okay, and here we go. And now the only difference in this one is that we're actually creating a zip file, right? So now we've done this, this wild true thing, right? And this wild true thing keeps going on until it gets an actual spot, which we can save. And then what it does, we break out, and we come down here and we print the name, and we create the zip file, okay? Now we're gonna walk the tree and add the zip and add to the zip file, right? So my guess was zip file.add. Let's see what the real thing is. It's actually not right. There you go, right? So what we're doing here is we say, we use this traditional, we have all that, that code that we typed in at the top, that's still there. Notice we still do the dash dash snip, so follow along. But now we have a zip that we've just created, right? And we have a folder name. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna walk that folder we're going to take out of it. Remember, os.walk is going to return a. Starts with a T and ends with Oople. There we go. It's going to return a tuple. And we know that because nothing can return three things in Python, right? You can only return a tuple that you can break down into those three things. So it's returning a tuple. And that tuple has folder names, subfolders, and file names. And then we say print adding files in. And we take a string, just one, folder name. So whatever that first thing is, adding files in folder name, we say backup.write, we have that zip, folder name. Right? So we're writing to the backup zip the folder name. Now we're going to add all of the files in this folder to the zip file. For each file name and file names, so remember, this guy over here is a... That's it. Who said it? You, got, you can raise your hand, you got it right. You should be like, yo, I'm over here. If you got it wrong, I would have You pass, uh, you, you have enough humbleness for both of us. Okay, so we have this thing, this, this file names thing, right? We say for each file name in file names, right? Now we have this list that we're returning, and we're iterating over that list. And we say here, new base equals os.path base name, and we give it a folder, right? Now, where does that folder come from? That folder is the same one we passed to the function. It's the same one we're walking over, right? So we're finding out when we iterate through that directory, we have a structure and a file. We're taking out of that the, struct, the, the, the base, the structure, right? And then we say if file name starts with new base and file name ends with dot zip continue, why are we doing that? We don't want to back up. We don't want to put into our zip file the zip files that are already in the directory. Remember, we're going into the directory and we're saving the zip file in that directory. So when we run it the second time, should we add the zip file from the first one? And we run it the third time, should we add the zip file from the first and second run? We want to skip that. So this is the code here to handle that. Don't back it up. Continue. Skip to the next file. Right? Then we say if, if we don't, we pass this test, we didn't continue, then what we're going to do is we're going to say backup zip.write, 
os.path join, and we're going to join all that crap together. So we're essentially going to say, if it's not a zip file, then take all of that path that we have, right, the path components we have, and save that thing into our backup zip. And then we say backup zip.close, and we're done. And then here's what it looks like when we run it. Adding delicious one.zip, adding files one, adding directory, adding files in, rather. Adding files in directory, adding files in directory, adding files in directory. You'll notice each time it says adding files, we're processing a new directory, right? Because the os.walk returns one item, one tuple for the directory. And inside of that directory, it has a list of all the subfolders and all the file names. Okay. And I want to take one more note to something here. Let me be sure here before. Yes, this is this is something you can think about too. And this will this this is interesting to think about. Subfolders, we don't use that at all, right? Am I missing something? We're not using that at all. We don't use it at all because it doesn't matter, right? The only thing that matters is what folder we're in and what files are in that folder. If it's a subdirectory, os.walk will go into it for you and it'll return to you another tuple, representing the folder that represents that and all of the files inside of it. So subfolders doesn't matter, because right. this is just things that os.walk will later go into itself. It, it matters to os.walk, though. Yes. But, and that's what the line says, yeah. Well, os.walk is giving you this. It has it its own copy. It's giving you back subfolders. It doesn't matter to you. It matters to os.walk. Right. os.walk doesn't have to give it out. Right. In some cases, it may matter to you. Right. If you wanted to say, print out all of the subfolders in this folder are this, and then later go into them too, you could do that, if that makes sense. Yeah. It's really difficult to talk about three different things in terms of just saying folders. Right. Right. Saying it doesn't matter, defining it as it doesn't matter to us. Is this application. Yeah. That's exactly right. right? Yep. Okay. So we say here ideas for similar programs, right? And this is where they tell you how you can waste your own time developing your Python skills. If none of you have ideas of how you can improve your Python skills and sharpen that axe, which you all intend to wield for gainful employment at later points in time, here are some ideas. And I do suggest them if you're really that bored. You know, I always found programming out of necessity to drive me forward. But if you want to program and you don't have an idea for a plan, hit it off. Uh, practice utilities. What is the difference between shutil.copy and shutil.copy tree? Copy is a single file, but tree is the whole tree structure. Exactly right. All right. In the back, let's see if you do this one. Uh, what function is used to rename files? I want to move. Exactly. All right. Randy, hit up the next one. Uh, what is the difference between the delete functions and send to trash and the shutil module? Send to trash versus delete it. What's the difference? One, one does the remove. Or the, the send to trash does the actual move. The utility does the remove tree function. It, it, it's, it takes the pointers out. Not exactly. Uh, you want to give it a shot? So the delete deletes the file. I mean, it's a permanent whack, but the other one moves it to the trash folder, basically. Right. Send to trash isn't actually deleting anything. It's literally grandma delete. So grandma delete doesn't actually delete files because we don't trust grandma to confidently make a final decision. So what we do is we move all of grandma's files when she says delete to the trash bin. Why? Because when grandma normally throws shit out of the trash can, if she forgets about it, tomorrow morning after she's had her tea and crumpets, she can go digging through the trash can. But computers aren't quite as forgiving. So when grandma sends her you know, password file or whatever she's saving on that computer, and she deletes that, if she was to delete it for good, she'd have a bad time after she finished those teas and crumpets, right? So we move all of that crap into a special directory. There's nothing special about the trash can. If there's nothing you take out of the class, you can take that out of the trash. The trash can is no different than any other folder or directory on any computer. It is another one by the name of trash, right? It's just, you could, you could rename it. You could call it Bob's Your Uncle and just move all of the stuff into Bob's Your Uncle until you were safe to delete it. That's all it's doing. So this utility here, send to trash, 
What it does that's unique is remember we talked about the path name stuff and we said that the path name thing changes from Windows to Mac to Linux and all that other crap. We went through that and we said if you're going to program for all of these different platforms, you've got to have more knowledge, a little bit of more know-how. Well, the send to trash module is no different. <clears throat> the trash can of Windows is in a different location than the trash can in Linux. And it's in a different location than the trash can in, in the trash can. But, uh, but SHUtil does not actually remove the does not actually remove the file. It just removes the pointers to the file. But that is effectively removing the file. If you have nothing pointing to the file, it's gone. No, you can you can still. But spent years going and retrieving files where the pointers were removed from. You're right, but but what you're talking about there is data forensics, and it depends yeah. on the file system, right? We already went through that. But yes, when you delete a file on a computer, you simply remove the index to it. The computer doesn't know where it's at. It can start to write stuff and to there. Doesn't Python have automatic garbage collection? So it in fact moved it. But that's with Python's memory, not with files on disk. Oh, I see. so you're confusing those two things. Okay. Well, anyway, we will go into the technicalities of this after the class. Yes. It is entirely possible, like if you're using the SSD with the discard option, that it will literally remove the file. Your capacitors get drained and it's totally gone. Yes. Let's, let's do that after class, right? And then we'll totally geek out about how files are stored. <laughs> but the answer to the question for everyone here is that the send to trash module has a function in it that looks like it's deleting stuff, it's moving it into a special magical folder, just like any other folder, and you later empty it out yourself. While the, the SHUtil module, it's gone for good. Zip file objects have a close method, just like file objects close method. What zip file method is equivalent to a file object's open method? Now, we went through that in class explicitly. So, someone should know it. Anyone want to give it a chance? Zip file dot zip file? That's right. You're really good. Thanks. We need to let other people be really good too. <laughs> because I want to get some of the sleepers away. But yes, I, 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 you are exactly 100% right. But I went through it and I even said that the zip file method is capitalized and the zip file module name is not. And I drew that distinction, and I said, this is a constructor. When I said constructor, 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 the reason why I was saying that is because I want you to see that they're the same. And this is the way the author is trying to drill that point through your head, too. Because when you start to see things in terms of when are you constructing an object, and what are you returning, you start to see, you get that. It'll make a lot more sense to you. So what he's saying here is a zip file, you have to have a method of creating a zip file, right? The method of creating a file is open. How do you create a zip file? How do you create, how do you construct a zip file? If you're really pretentious, how do you instantiate it? <laughs> okay, uh, practice projects. For practice, write programs do the following tasks. We are not gonna do any of those because we have six minutes and because I hate live coding this shit. <laughs> if anyone wants to do any of them, we can cover them in the next class where you can ask on the Discord channel. If there's anyone who's not in the Discord, uh, find someone today in the classroom, get in touch with them, join the Discord, Discord Give a shout out in the Python channel because that's the class. If you have free laptops, wait, don't pack up yet. I haven't hit you up and I'm not passing around a collection plate, I'm just taking your old shit. If you have free laptops laying around, I'm serious. There are still people in Houston that cannot afford them, right? There are still people where they don't have them, where theirs was broken and they're in between jobs. Donate them to me. I have my own space now inside of cPanel which I can use to store old shit because I don't have anything else in there right now. It's pretty, pretty empty. So yeah, donate your old laptops. We have put them to good use. In this class, someone got one. And yet we, we, can, we can distribute something we can do. All right, thank you everyone. Does anyone have any other announcements? Are we good? Actually, is anybody really good with Git? I'm yeah. decent, I guess, if okay. you want. I, I, might. I have a totally after the topic topic. Yeah, yeah. You want to hit up the whole class or you want me to come over there and take a look at it? I mean, anybody know how to remove files out of one uh, folder and put them into a, a new repository? I know you can do from one repository to another repository, but how do you take files so we can preserve history? You mean you want to leave them from the history? Preserve. No, no, I want to preserve the history. I want to take like a subfolder that's in a git repository move it into its own brand new repository, but preserve its history. Ah, okay. Yes, I've done that before. I think, I think it's something for you. Wow. 
I think get sub is the way to do it too. So I would definitely okay. need to get sub free. All right. Uh, and we can help you out with that as well. All right, very cool. Uh, yes, join the join the the, uh, the chatting channels, and we'll be all good. Thank you for coming out. If you have any advice how I can make this class better, get in touch with me. I take criticism, even not constructive mean kinds. <laughs> <laughs>